So right. we thought we would do for this event um, a mixed grouping from uh, the village of Merso, because it's my personal favourite of the white wine villages. I don't mean to say it necessarily has the all the grand wines, because of course, Pilin Maraché, most people would put at the top of that tree. And I'm becoming increasingly fond of Chassin Maraché because of uh, the younger group of winemakers there. And we're going to have an evening, I think it's the 12th of April, when we look at those. Uh, but Mercer works for me so well on uh, the village level as well as the crew level. Uh, there are no Grand Crews, of course. And I think it's because Merceau wasn't greedy that you get real value out of the Premier Cruise. And equally, um, the village wines are, to my way of thinking, clearly a step up from uh, most of the other white wine villages. And it's partly because, um, unlike Pununi in particular, the water table is that much uh, further away from the service, uh, surface. So it's possible to have uh, nice deep cellars, which are really great for aging the wine. So there's been a much longer tradition in Merceau than Pyrenee or even Chassain of aging the wines for a second winter in wood before you bottle them. So the format uh, today is uh, four whites from 2017 and 2014 together, two of each, uh, three, uh, two of villages and two of premier crews. Then we have um, four wines from 2012, three Premier Crews plus an absolutely top village site, uh, and then four Premier Crews from 2002. So we, we get to get, um, we get to see a very nice overview from good vintages of what Massa has been up to over the last 20 years. And then because you need a little bit of red wine before you go home in the evening, uh, we have got uh, three wines from the neighboring or near neighboring villages of Volney and Pomar. And um, Michael has convinced himself that Marcinet is uh, also uh, near enough to Merceau, so we're having one from the amazing Sylvain Pataille. So uh, you've got those four um, to finish off with, and I hope to be able to stay with you just long enough to uh, make a couple of comments about them. Uh, I'll certainly stay with you otherwise through the first two sets of four wines and to introduce the 2002s and, uh, and mention the Reds. Right, so uh, Merceau, ancient village, it's got so many good growers. I reckon nowadays that I am visiting between 40 and 50 different producers a year in Merceau, and I can think of another 10, 10 names that uh, probably ought to be on my visiting list, but you can't do everything. Um, and that's amazing because at the time that I started out in 1981, um, Lafon was sort of known about but wasn't really being shipped very much. Costury was virtually unheard of. Uh, Rouleau was known about. Um, uh, the Jobars were known about, but I mean, really, you would have been saying maximum six names of interest. Uh, and now it's spread so much wider. Um, so of the grand classics, we've, we've got um, uh, Lafon in several renditions, and we've got uh, one from, from Rouleau. Apart from that, there are people whose names were not so much on the radar back then, even though they or their parents, grandparents, were producing wine from quite some while earlier. So um, do you have anything in your glasses yet? I can't see easily. Yeah, you have two or four wines. We have four wines, the first four. Okay. Right. Um, well, if you have a little taste of the first two, so uh, slightly unfair if you were trying to judge sort of uh, between the two of them insofar as you have a good sound um, of the road uh, village wine in Grand Charon and you have the grandest of the Premier Cruz in Perrier, um, from two people who are uh, small-scale cunts, but mostly underneath the um, the real sort of investor speculator radar. So wines are, are, are not cheap, cheap, but at the same time, uh, you can probably still find them at, at a price that doesn't hurt too much. So Pierre Boisson, Les Grands Charon. Grand Charon is... Um, a vineyard which can be really excellent or it can be rather ordinary to how high up the slope you are because it starts coming out of the uh, sort of the west side of the village and the lowest parts of the rows in Grand Charon are uh, almost flat. Um, so for example, very good producer, their sort of entry level drinking Merceau is their Grand Charon because their holding is more on the slightly lower land. 
But as you go up towards the top, um, you get next to Tesson, which is a lot more favorite, uh, famous, and Rougeau, which would be more famous if it had more good grairs in it. Um, and you begin to make something very special. So, for example, the Côte des Grands Charons from the Chateau de, uh, de Merceau is, is really an exceptional wine. Um, I don't know where the Boissons have their holding. This used to be known as the main Boisson Vado, and as you see on the score sheet, that wine number three, Merceau Chevalier, is Boisson Vado. But the father of the current generation, Bernard Boisson, married to a Vado, um, retired, I think, after the 2016 vintage. And since then, the wines are either under his son Pierre's name or daughter Anne. Uh, they, they tend to look after slightly different vineyards in the grouping of everything that's done. Uh, the domain it's not a big domain it's uh, eight eight and a half hectares in absolute total various mercos quite a bit of bourgoin ocdrs uh, a couple of red wines um 2017 as we know is one of the good uh vintages for white burgundy and one which i think is actually becoming very decent to drink now it's not one that you absolutely have to keep for the longest time but it should age well but now at six years, it's, it's beginning to show its paces. Um, it was a, a year which favoured the whites more than the reds, because it was a, a, a standard full crop in white, and it was a particularly big crop. Uh, in, um, but I like it very much. What it's proving to be is slightly richer and fuller bodied than we've perhaps thought, with this good acidity as well. So the boissons are very traditional. It's all barrel aged for up, up to 18 months. Uh, this yeah. is new oak. They do nothing sort of out of the ordinary, if you like, but, the, but, it, but it's a traditional sort of winemaking. They aren't particularly people who like to talk about the techniques. When I went to see Bernard Boisson, he was fascinating about the history, about the family, about the terroirs, but he didn't really want to get into the detail of, of what I sometimes call the techno babble, uh, the discussion of techniques. But they're traditionalists and probably only first came on the scene about 10 years ago um, when people, uh, they got picked up by UK and Porter and the first um, mentions with wine writers um, and they're extremely well thought of. Almost all their wines were at village level or generic level rather than uh, Premier Cru. So who's going to be the spokesman for how the 2017 Grand Charles is tasting? Uh, I'm going to get myself in slight trouble here because <laughs> on the tooth, the, the, the Perrier tastes quite evolved for me. And I was asking if it was fine because it really does. I mean, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure if it's the, uh, it's the winemaking and that's the style of it. But if you taste the two together, I, I find that the, seven, the, the Perrier is quite evolved for me on the nose and on the palate. As much as I hate to say, I agree with you. Uh, yeah, well, we, this is a green we may be having uh, a mild case of Premox. Yeah. Premox has not gone away completely, but it tends to be milder than it used to be. And I also think that uh, the wines grow out of it more often than not. But it's typically around about five or six years where you're most likely to have it. I had um, uh, two bottles, uh, the original, then somebody opened the spare, of a 2016 Corton Chalon. Years ago, and um, yeah, and that was exactly the same thing. Um, when when the first one was open, um, the the guy opening it checked it and said, "Good, there's that's no problem, it's fine." But even fifteen minutes later, it was showing it. And Sebastian said that the bottles were fine when he opened them, so it's it's arrived quite quickly. But I suspect, unfortunately, that you have got a little bit of a case of the the pox, the Premox. Because there's no reason. The orange Chemin wines are sometimes a little bit fuller in colour, um, but you know it shouldn't be very tired at this stage in its life. Um, so that's a disappointment. It's a, it's a domain I believe in. Um, orange Chemin um, uh, set up in Merceau in 1973. Uh, his wife is of the Pio, Pio family in Chassain Morachet, so they really have various Chassains as well as their Merceaux. Um, um, has taken over and have been in charge for quite a while and he's married to a Miss Jobar uh, so probably some vines from that side of the family too and now that Luke is working with them um, so uh, it's all organic 
bad dynamic, but um, that bottle evidently has not come through as well as it should. But has the uh, is the um, the Boisson 2017 is that showing well? Yeah, very well. I, I mean, I really liked it. I like it on the nose and I like it on the palate. Uh, it's a lovely wine. I mean, it's not over, it's not overly complex, but very very happy to drink this. Uh, can I ask you, Jasper? Can I ask a question? What's the difference in philosophy? To the winemaking of the two, if you had a differentiator between the two, you know, I don't think there is a massive um, uh, difference. They're both up to eighteen months in barrel. Um, neither uses a lot of new wood. Um, they both would consider themselves traditionalists. Um, I don't know when the Boissons um, choose to make, because picking dates can make a difference. The Germans tend to be right in the middle, so there's nothing specific to 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 say there. Um, you know, I would not consider them dissimilar. Certainly on the palette, we can see the difference. That's probably the pre-mox, but uh, yeah, must yeah. Be pretty much. Yeah, themselves. I think I, I I think we have to label the Germans today as, as as being a disappointing bottle. So, um, I'm sorry about that. Um. But Do you think that the gets I don't think you should. I don't think you should necessarily um, take a dim view of the domain uh, because one bottle has failed us. And do we have the orange map? Well, we got a 2012 and a 2002, so we've got that domain in in all three brands. So um, we'll see how the other two work later on. Now, uh, alongside that, you have got two 2014s. So again, we have a village wine from Boisson Vado, so it's still got the parents' name, and it's Chevalier, which I really like. So if you walked up the hill from Grand Charon, got to the top of um, the vineyard, you would be in the left-hand part of the vineyard, you would have Tesson above you. The right-hand part of the vineyard, you'd have uh, Rougeau above you. And if you then walked a few more paces to your north, you'd come to Chevalier. Um, really nice. Um, vineyard with uh, quite a light, friable soil, um, which um, uh, erodes quite easily um, on, on a, a decent slope because we're higher up here. And everybody I know who makes Chevalier, I think probably Fiché is the person I know best in this vineyard, um, makes a jug of wine out of it. So 2014, as we've established in the past, uh, really, really nice white burgundy vintage which for a while I've thought has been quite closed down and if anything, seeming to get younger and younger. Uh, now, just recently, I've begun to see a little bit of evolution, still young wine, eight years old, which means nine years, uh, but they're just beginning to open out once again. And alongside that, we have the Lafont Merceau Boucher. So classically, Merceau just had Perrier, um, Charme, Genevrier and Goutte d'Or and the Premier Cruz. And then from 2011 vintage, he picked up um, Porizo uh, and Boucher as well. And, and this Boucher, prior to 2011, was the holding made by um, uh, Lefleur. Sorry, not Lefleur, what am I saying? Hold uh, made by uh, Jean Marc Rouleau. Yeah. Yeah, both, just uh, both have to step in, step in quality. I think it's also to do. With more bottle age, the ghost has got a bit more weight, both of them. Yes. And they're both, they're both showing really well. Although I have to say that I just got a slight pre preference for the uh, the Boisson Vadel. Is that how right. you say it? So, yeah, Boisson Vadel. Oh. So, play, play two, one, two for Boisson Vadel. Yeah. That's exciting. Um, I believe they have a good importer um, in, uh, in Hong Kong. Um, Ginsberg and Chan, and uh, would like you. You may not still be able to find yeah. this, but you should be able to find yeah. them. Yeah. As a, a, <laughs> okay, price. No, yeah, I think that was on, really, really just thing on the nose. I'm like the early ones. Sweet so so thing, yeah. Very, very right aromatic, it's all crushed rocks, very precise and linear. Right. Yeah. My yeah. Yeah. Um, Pierre Boisson, I, I um, uh, understand, was at the um, wine school with Raphael Costurie. So um, whether or not they have uh, sort of discussed techniques together, I don't know. But um, I've never had a disappointing 
people from them. Of course, they don't have the famous uh, Premier Cruise on the hull. Um, but everybody who's come to know these wines, did you know them before, or is it new to you? New to me. Hey, that's great. A discovery has been made. <laughs> We're all whispering yeah. here. We're going to have to find some. <laughs> well, that's right. well, I, what, I, what I'm going to do is I, I, should, I should have taken a snapshot of world prices before this session started and another one at the end of the session and, and see what's happened. Um, it's a pretty small domain, so I'm never going to be huge volumes around. Um, but good to know. And the Lafon the Lafon Boucher, how's that showing? So very nice, very very nice. I like it. The Yeah. It's like yeah. Boucher. What about the Boucher? I like that, but the other one more. Okay. The subtlety about the Boucher vineyard is that um, it's one where you. Um, need to pick it very early. It's it's often the first. It was for Jean Marc, um, and it is now with Lafont uh, because it gets uh, too soft and you get a few more exotic aromatics if you leave it. So, um, so that's definitely. Um, pays off. And I think everybody who makes it now probably understands that. Yeah. Right. So. Um, Points for Boisson in both vintages and also points for Lafont in their one wine. And again, we're going to see Lafont in all three brackets, so we'll be able to see how things have changed. Um, I'm hoping to do with Dominic Lafont and the new generation there, Dominic having retired uh, just over a year ago. I'm hoping to do a, um, a sort of retrospective vertical of every vintage that Dominique made at the Domain with the family um, in the next month or two. It should be really exciting. I shall report on that. Okay, so does it? Are you now getting the next bracket of four coming out? Yeah, we've just gotten the Rouleau yeah, as well as the Le Bond and every twelve. Okay, since they're all four twelve, uh, you might as well taste them one, two, three, four. So mm -hmm. one, one and two are um, the Rouleau. Um, who do you want to sell? Montpensier. So it, it's close into the vineyards we've already been having. Um, and it changed its name. I think 2011 was either the... It used to be called Les Tessons Clos de Montpensier. But I pointed out to Jean-Marc that the um, legend that's on above the vineyard on a, on a, a little stone archway says um Claude Duot Tessant Mon Plaisir so from either eleven or twelve uh to that name. So then what do we have alongside that? We have La Fon Genevrière, um his favorite, my favorite, uh probably of his premier cruise. Well maybe he likes Perrier more, but I love the elegance of the Genevrière. Um recently I had one in London a month or so ago, both the Genevrière 11 and the Charm 11. And the Genevrier was way more exciting. The charm was just a little bit um, not 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 quite feeling it so, uh, the right moment to drink it. It was just a little bit clumsy. Uh, nothing wrong with it, but it didn't quite show. But the Genevrier 11 was an absolutely beautiful bottle. And I'm hoping the 12 will be. Very small crop because of both hail and bad flowering. Then after that, you can um, look at um, Orange Germain's Perrier alongside Vincent Dancer's Perrier. And so Vincent Dancer recently seems to have leapt up from being one of the good producers to being one of the uh, cult producers with much higher pricing than we would ideally like. Um, so there, there are the 12s um, to play with. You taste through them, one, two, three, four. Certainly in the marketplace, um, the Tesson from Rouleau is going to be up there at sort of fully fledged Premier Crew pricing. Um, I'm not sure if if that or Dancer would be the most expensive wine if they came up. Um, probably Germain would be the least expensive of the four on the secondary market. So 12, uh, 2012 is now 10 to 11 years old. Should be getting it into an excellent place. I, it was a small crop and I don't actually see them all that often. So it'll be very, very interesting to know how they're showing. 
um, whether they're beginning to reach full maturity or whether they still seem quite young and crisp and energetic. Um, it showed very well when we did the 10 year on tasting here in Bouillon um, in June of last year. And the twelves were looking in a very good place. The Premier Cruise and upwards still young. The village wines pretty much fully ready. So I am going to place the betters to and put them in the order I think I would probably enjoy them, and I put them in the order I think they're probably going to show for the team today. So uh, um, when you're ready, um, Michael or somebody would like to speak at least about the. Um, uh, the ruler, and then move on from there. Jasper, I have a quick question before you move on to the second, the second flight. Can you yeah. just talk a tiny bit about the difference between 14 and 17? Because there's a clear, yeah, the vintage wise, because there's definitely a clear difference between the two, and there's three years obviously of bottle age, but yes. in reality, that's not a humongous amount. No, I don't know how that's showing today, but um. 14 was a very fresh, tight, tense vintage. Uh, I mean, the grapes were only just ripe. Some of the reds weren't fully ripe. The whites did ripen, but they kept quite high acidity. And they remained, for me, they have remained um, quite fresh and quite backward. Now, was your comment because you think they have evolved by more than three years between the two? Yeah, OK. Um, well, that's a surprise. To me. Yes. Uh, yeah, I did uh, start uh, with Very the fresh, yes, that I thought they were now beginning to come round. Um, yeah, don't know um, uh, how long they were, um, whether they've been kicking around in the marketplace or whether um, whether they've been sort of in your cellars since uh, almost the start. But um, I would have expected the 14s to be showing, if anything, the younger of the pairings, even though they're three years older. So interesting that that's not the case. Okay, are, are you ready for a first comment on the second fly? Yeah. So sadly, the uh, Alphonse Genevra is a bit cork. I know. But, but the Rulo is showing one of them. Um, the Henri Germain 12 is so meaningfully fresher than the 17th Oh, that's encouraging. Uh, yeah. Uh, and the Vincent Dancer 12 is um, as it should be. Right. <laughs> I, 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 it, it's, um, so you're, you're, uh, what I'm reading out of that, whether that's correct or not, is Rouleau first, Germain second, Dancer third. You, Michael? Uh, no, 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 not yet. We're not, oh, yeah, not at that point. We're not at that point. Oh, it's still tasty, so you haven't got that far. All right, yeah, yeah. I beg your pardon. We've just been forward some of them. Voting has not closed. I, right, I, okay, I find... okay, right. The ballot is, uh, is still... I find... I find One thing I would say is, of course, yeah. 2012 is the last vintage from Lafont when he put the wines under cork. After that, he's moved to Diam from 2013. Um, reason for doing it was more to do with oxidation, but but just general unreliability, unreliability of course. Well, we'll have to find a, an excuse to open a bottle of Ginevra 12 when I'm over next month, because um, that, that's disappointing, but you know. Cork bottles happen, we're aware of that. They do. Um, I think the, for me, it's the dancer first, Actually, maybe a slightly preferred the Henri Germain and then the Rouleau. But the, the Rouleau is yeah. uh, very sharp, very focused. Maybe needs even more time. I quite like the Rouleau. Whereas the that wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah. I mean, yeah. focus being focused and, and fresh and sharp are very much the Rouleau style. It's what he wants to make. Um, yeah. I hear that uh, Tina Turner voted for Dancer first, such a fine dancer. No. <laughs> just, just for jokes on you. No comment on the. No, I'm just going. To, uh, I'm trying to get over the joke. Um, <laughs> I, I have to say that my favourite is the dancer as well, uh, not the Tina Turner version, but the 
um, but the Vincent version. Yeah, uh, that's my. Favorite. And I, I know a slight preference to Arulo over the uh, uh, Henri Germain. Yeah. Yeah. both they're both really nice. It would be interesting to see what the Lafon was like in that in that company. But it's an interesting, you know, the the twelves. I think they're in a good space uh, place to eat. Uh, drink, sorry. No, eat. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Just, yeah, 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 no, eat the cork really and drink the wine. I, I would expect anyway, so. And you know, it is a vintage which I like more than it's it's one of those which because it wasn't the grand vintage, uh, it's not a bad vintage, but it just gets forgotten about. It just doesn't really get, you know, it doesn't come up in common. Um, but I've always thought of it as a very good vintage for white. Um, and um, I will have to have a little look. I think I have a horrible feeling that um, I remember there was one vintage, and I think it was 12, when Dominique said, look, we've made so little wine, uh, I'm not going to let you have any. Uh, he normally would give me a... Um, a little bit of an allocation so i'm just going to check in my cellar and see see if i've got but i have a horrible feeling that i don't have any uh of that vintage uh, can, can i ask, uh, yeah. can i ask a question and i don't want to put foot in it but in terms of these wines um i, I love the nose i love the palate yeah. they don't have they don't have weight i expected more weight is that a question of age or just a question of their mercers. Uh, no, I think I think that's uh, I, you know I think I I think that is the style of the vintage. Um, it, it, yeah, it, it, what it's got is purity. Uh, mm. I find, um, but not, not so much um, uh, power and weight. No, uh, yeah. but I, 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 there there is a freshness and also an honesty about these wines, which is lovely. Mm. And you get that, uh, but you're right. I mean, for me, I'm not getting that weight or that power, and and that's a good thing. Yes, we're we're also talking about um, producers who have moved away from the old style, um, consciously moved away from the old style uh, Merso when you were looking for round weight, body, and the rest of it. So Rulo in particular, I mean, chiselled is the word, dances in that direction to La Fond definitely. Um, in the sort of second half of his winemaking career. Henri Germain, um, so, uh, sort of a little bit in between the two, but definitely wanting it to be fresh uh, as, uh, as a serving body. Um, and also less so, reduction as well, isn't there? There's what? There's less reduction in the in the winemaking. Um, at that point, in fact, 2012 for Rulo was a vintage which went through a very, very reductive um, phase. Uh, he said it caught him out because it only really happened in the second winter. It was about that time that he moved from doing a second winter in barrel and started doing it in tank, but keeping the wine on the lees. And if you keep your wine on the lees for extra time, but it's in tank, then there is no oxygen exchange. And that's where you get the reductive winemaking. Um, now I was talking. That was my comment on all the wines rather than Rulo's wine. I was talking yeah. about in terms of the all the Mercos that we had so far. I, I I don't know. Maybe I came here with a, a view that there will be more expecting reduction. to have more reduction. No, I yeah. think seventeen and fourteen people are beginning to move away from it. Um, what's quite interesting is normally when you get a technique in inverted commas that arrives in Burgundy, people start to. Um, take it too far, and then the market revolts against it. But in the case of reduction, whether it's Rudo or Pierre Yves Colin Moray or indeed Costuri, I think the growers themselves decided to take it too far before the market turned against it uh, and they began to back off. But 2012, I would have expected to have been very much in the middle of it. But the wines do, with extra time, they do start to lose that reductive character. It doesn't stay with them forever in their lives. So maybe the fact that it's 10 years old now has, has sorted that. Can I, it's a, are you seeing for Merso, or are you seeing a, a, almost a change going back to more chiseled, more purity, more minerality, if you want to, if you want to call it that way, rather than having more fat, more power. So allowing, allowing the grapes and the soil to speak more for itself. Yes, but that's been the trend that's been in place since, um, for about 15 years now. And if anything, you're going to start pe seeing people going back the other way <laughs> uh, because everybody is in this fresher style. Um, but um, 
Yes, and some people think that both uh, Rouleau and Arno Arndt uh, have gone too far and they pick too early and they make the wines too fresh. Uh, I yeah. don't do that. I find both those producers, I love their wines. I think they age really well. Um, but I do often hear, particularly from other um, producers in Merceau, that um, you know they, they, they think it's been exaggerated. Um, but fortunately, in Burgundy, it's never the case that everybody heads in the same direction at the same time. Uh, so you've always got um, point and counterpoint. And if one person isn't quite to your taste, then you can find somebody else. Um, but what can, can, I, can I ask a question? The, yeah. can, I, can I ask a question? Yeah. Which is, and I mean, when you're looking at this stuff and you're talking about a pendulum, they're going for one side and they're swinging to the other side. So who's coming out of the, the, the producer you, you're tasting? Who's coming out with a different voice, a different expression for Mercer? Well, for Mercer, uh, the person, I mean, the sort of people I have in mind would be somebody like Lemmy Kayar and Chassin Morache, but perhaps um, Romeric uh, Chevichoué, Domain uh he certainly doesn't want to be um, too much in the, um, in the, in the very sort of ultra fresh modern camp. Um, you get plenty of weight in Xavier Mono's wines. Um, Chaubert's always had good weight in the wines, but nonetheless, Antoine Chaubert is making uh, a fresher style of wine than uh, his father Francois used to. Um, let me see if uh, if any other names come to me um, during the during the tasting, um, then I will uh, uh, add add those in to. Uh, um, to the list of people who are making rather more full-bodied uh, Mercedes. But it's a bit difficult now compared to what would have happened, let's say, in the 80s, insofar as that if you let your leave your grapes to hang on the vine until they're golden, um, which would have been the case, nowadays they're picked more of a, a greeny gold or, or um, colour, but if you wait till they're fully golden, they're going to get way too high in alcohol, in sugar levels and therefore alcohol. So because of, of global warming, I think you do have to pick them uh, at a slightly less ripe um, phenolic stage, perhaps. Um, Jacques Prière in Merceau is a domain that likes to pick a little bit later, and so you'll probably tend to get fuller bodied wines there. Um, and I'm sure I'll think of some more before we're finished. You're a bit issue that uh, with global warming, are you picking earlier and stuff, less phenolic and things like that? Uh, the biggest well, so, um, is a funny word because I think people use it in different senses. Um, and it's often used pejoratively, meaning you've got something that's a little bit too sort of green and leafy coming into the flavors. Um, and there are some people who don't like that. There's a school of thought now in white burgundy making, which wants the wines to taste really pure and clean from the start. I'm not completely convinced by that because I know how great white burgundy can be if you leave it for a long time. And Michael, certainly, possibly some others of you were at uh, the Tour d'Argent in 2018. And one of the wines we picked off the list was the Le Fleur Village Pinot Morachet 1979 at 100 euros a bottle uh, on a Michelin star wine list at, um, with a wine at nearly 40 years of age. And it was an absolute stunner. But it might well have been a little bit ugly um, first up. Um, and nowadays, people feel that they want to make wines which are attractive to drink first up, so they are less phenolic. But one of the characteristics of the phenols is that is also where the preservative characters of the wine lie. So that's why the whites are aging more quickly, being ready earlier, which for many people is a good thing, and aging more quickly, which for me, at least, is a bad thing. Um, and I suspect for you as well. Um, so, yeah, still plenty more discussion to go ahead with how white uh, burgundies are made. Um, any further comments you'd like to send my way about the quartet of 2012s uh, or the trio, as one was, um, you know, didn't make it. Is that a vintage that you will now look out for more or you won't look out for more? <laughs> Is it one of five? I have to say, Jeff, for having tasted it, the twelves I've got, I'm going to start bringing them out. Yeah, because I think I think especially on the uh, 
finish your Premier League. Uh, I'm sorry, Premier League. I'm going to start bringing them out because I kept them. And I think this is. I, I'm going to actually bring them out because I think they're going to be. I, I'm not sure they're going to improve overly much. No, and I think, I think that's probably that. fair. I think that's fair. I think there'd be a, a good place to start looking at them. Yeah. And I just checked. I did. Uh, I I actually have very few white burgundy 2012s, partly because uh, I didn't get uh, any from the fall. Uh, unfortunately, it was 12 and not 14. I haven't started any of my uh, 14s yet. Um, so I'm I'm uh, a little bit shorter than I'd like to be of um, of the 2012 uh, white vintage. So. Um, where should we go from there? Let's, uh... Would you like a little bit more time then with um, uh, with that flight, or are you ready to move to the next flight? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in 2002, I'm expecting quite a lot of variability by now. It was a definite Premox um, style vintage. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that they have all come through. Oh dear, my holding of 2012 white burgundies is uh, distressingly slim. Right. Um, so the 2002s we have got lined up um, are Moray Blanc. That means it's Pierre Moray, but his negociant side. Um, and not called Blanc because they're all in white wines, but Moray Blanc because his wife's name, she, her family name was Blanc. So they used that for their um, negotiation business. And he obviously has Perrier himself, but the Genevrier was um, purchased grapes or juice. Alongside uh, La France Massa Genevrier 02. So we're hoping for that that's in better shape than the Corpse 12. Compare the Genevrier with the Perrier in 02. And um, we really like the Genevra. I think one of my, my last trip in Hong Kong before COVID lockdowns, I think we finished on the last day with the La Fon Merceau um, um, tasting, featuring lots of Genevra. Um, and then Henri Germain continues to uh, uh, be part of the team. Um, so we'll get those poor brown and I'll leave you a minute or two to enjoy. 2002. Um, as a red and a white wine vintage at the time, without thinking it was truly great in either, it was just good. It was mixed, not bad, but mixed uh, through the de um, through the summer. Until early September, it was definitely hanging by a thread, whether it was going to be a good year or not. And then fortunately, the wind patterns changed. There was less rainfall in September, a cool north wind, which uh, dried the vineyards out. Um, and finished the ripening, but without giving generous sugar levels, um, completed the growing season. And um, I was pretty comfortable with the vintage in both colours. It was quite a big crop in white, but nicely ripened. And in red, it was a normal size crop and only just ripe, but very pretty wines, which I think are in a good place now. Um, the whites should be either at their best now or some of them may, may be looking a little bit tired. So um, they weren't opened a lot in advance. For this tasting, I suggested to Sebastian just to open them up um, just before whatever time he needed to have them ready um, before the tasting started. Of this four, the marketplace is going to put the uh, La Forme Perrier in the first position. Uh, the others reasonably, probably reasonably similar, maybe Marseille Genevrier from La Forme just about second. Um, but you're not really going to see wines of this age much around in the market, I wouldn't have thought. We've actually done well to get three different vintages of uh, Henri Germain's Perrier because it's a very small holding for him. He only has 0 0.16 of a hectare. So that's just under four ouvres. So, um, you know, he might make um, two, three, four barrels a year from a small crop through to a very generous one. La Fon's got nearly a hectare of um, Perrier, 0 0.91, and half a hectare, 0.55, of the Genevrier. And Maury Blanc, of course, we don't know because it was um, purchased grapes, and I don't know who, who he would have got, got them from. So, of course, at this time, nobody's using Diam. Um, 
they haven't yet started the move towards the much more chiseled style of winemaking. Uh, Jasper, sadly, the uh, Marie Blanc uh, Mercer Genevieve 2 is um, more than advanced. It's totally oxidized. Oh, well. Uh, the Lafon Genevieve 2 is wonderful. Great. Wonderful. I have some of his uh, O2s. I occasionally look recently at the Clodal Bar, and that's beginning to show full maturity. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, Let's see what else have I, I've still got to try. Um, I still can't fully get my head around the fact that white burgundy doesn't last as long as it used to, and so I do tend to <laughs> tend to leave them around. Um, I have... I don't have a lot of 2002 left. One or two things, but not a lot. And uh, we're just getting the Perrier served now, Jasper. Yeah. I think oh, the Lafon Perrier is, is a, a little bit more advanced than the Lafon Genevieve. The Lafon Genevieve is just so yes. beautiful. Yes. In, in this period um, of the early and more, more dramatic Premox, I found Perrier to be the vineyard in Merceau that was much the most affected. There's something about the extra richness in Perrier that caused it to topple over more easily than the refined Genevieve. So it doesn't surprise me that the Perrier is a little bit, seems a little bit more advanced. It should have more weight, more body, but it doesn't surprise me that it's tasting a little bit more advanced. Uh, but the Germa O2 Perrier is stunning. Great. Good. Absolutely Good. stunning. Good. So... Well, you should you should spend a little longer on them, but it looks as though you've got um, two winners, one that's a bit further behind, and then a then a, a failure. So it'll be interesting to see if any of the wines develop quickly in the glass, or whether they maintain, or even become slightly fresher. In fact, um, obviously uh, the Mori Blanc. Yeah, yeah, more, 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 the, the further along. So I think the Lafon, the Lafon area is further along. The Genevieve is very fresh, and the German too is spectacular. Right. Well, that's wonderful. I'm very, really pleased for them. Um, uh, they're not, nice people who make good wine, and I was disappointed with the uh, 2017, as you reported it. So uh, they improved their. Uh, performance of the 2012 and they burst through the 2002 that's great so um and then the Genevieve should be all about precision and elegance and a lot of detail um the La Forge Genevieve and then as you say a bit more weight and a bit more advanced from the Perrier O2 um I need to leave you in just a few minutes so before I do while you enjoy that and hey, don't worry them hey, because I think cool. they should express more in the glass but I'll just mention what to expect from the four reds um, so you yes, Patai Marseille Ancestral, which is his top cuvee of red. It gets at least 24 months um, in barrel. Um, he's developed a technique which is pretty much unique, is that he likes to vinify as much as he can with whole clusters, but he does slightly crush the grapes to avoid having too much of a carbonic uh, expression. Um, so the whole bunches get crushed, but very, very gently, so that he's not actually crushing the, uh, the uh, stems at all. Um, and minimal sulfur, long aging, and uh, that's a wine which normally ages incredibly well. Um, after that, we have Comte Armand, Pomar, Claude Zepno, 2010. I think it's the best vintage that Ben made. He started in 99 and finished in 2013. And personally, every bottle I've had of that 2010 has been absolutely stellar. So I think that will be gorgeous. Um, Pustor, this was in the uh, after the time of Gerard Patel, so Patrick Londanger, uh, sort of the home vineyard, Clé de la Pustor, um, 2002, so brings us back a parallel with the whites. Should be in a very good place to drink now. I think Bolognese were good in 2002. This is very timely. Um, if you like uh, the 1985 Pomar Rougien from Old Man de Monti, this would have been Hubert de Monti rather than Etienne making the wines of that period. He made legendary 83s, but they're probably fully ready now and probably should be drunk up. 
but the only 85s I've ever had of his have been very good. And as it happens, there's a case coming up at auction on March the 16th of exactly that wine. It's one of those auctions you can bid for so far and nobody's bid for it. So uh, as of an hour ago. So if you really like it, um, there are some other wines from the 80s from De Monte. And I think that was a, a very good period for the demand. So I'm going to leave you to uh, enjoy those. Um, but before I go, if you have any other thoughts about the current flight or whether there are any more questions you want to ask about Merso and White Burgundy before I leave you. All good? <laughs> no one's asking you questions. I, 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 I've got loads of questions. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say, in terms of the, the Mercer, who, who, are your, who are your favorite producers and which are the, uh, uh, you'll answer the up and coming ones, right? But who's your favorite producers? Ouch. Uh, that's, that's not, no, by no means the easiest of questions. Okay. So you've you've got a front line which um, you know is recognised internationally, and I like all of those. So, Custery, Rulo, Ant, Affon would probably be the the big in no particular order would probably be the top four um, domains. But other people who I think are very good indeed would be Balomio, um, sensibly. Bernard Bonin, who have become very quickly um, cult and, uh, and so not so sensibly priced. Um, I'm just running down an alphabetic list. Of course, you've got Henri Boyer, who's uh, um, uh, both colors, but um, some sensational mercos. Um I like Michel Bouzereau, uh, very sensibly priced. Uh, and he has some great vineyards, Perrier, um, so they're good. Um, bum, 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 heading on down, other other favorites. I think Chevy Chua is well worth having a look at. Um, I tasted the wines when his father was making them, and he was a bit erratic. But I think the son Romeric uh, is 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 really interesting. Um, I've always been fond of Jean Philippe Fichet and the more chiselled. Yeah, questions. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> a good, last question because no one's asking you. I'm just curious if you were drinking a Merso, right? Yeah. If you only had one Merso to drink, what would it be? What I'm vintage? Not... What Merso? Um, right. Well, it's, well, it's, 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 it's going to be one of it, it's going to be one of two. It's either no, going to be Merso. It's either going to be Merso Genevrier from La Font, um, okay. and. I've, I've celebrated many rites of passage, including proposing to my wife with the 1981 vintage of that wine, um, but that would be pretty old now, so no specific. Maybe either, we had the 2010 very recently, uh, Monday of last week, and that's in a glorious position. So I'll go with that as one choice. The other would be the Sauv du Clos bottling from Arno Ant. So. However, if, 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 if I happen to have access to Michael's, it would obviously have to be one of his uh, many, many bottlings of, from uh, Mr. Costuri, but I, I'm going to go with Lafont and Arno Ant because I, um, they're two people who I know very well and, and enormously appreciate. So, giving you a double answer. Thank you. That's great. Answer. Which, I didn't finish the list of all the good people in, uh, in Merceau, but there are many more. There are so many good ones. And uh, I will leave you to enjoy the rest of the meal. It's been great uh, seeing you on screen. And in just uh, a month, just over a month now. Less maybe maybe Less in that month. very same room. So, uh, yeah. just, just uh, before you go, quick question. Instead yeah. of naming the producers, obviously yeah. we tried like the Premier Cruise um, yes. tonight so far. So, in terms of your just in your personal opinion, regardless of the producer, in Merso, the, the sort of top villages, top three villages that you think. The top better. three village wines. <laughs> Uh, my favorite, my favorite vineyards are Narvo, Tesson, and Chevalier. Is that your question? I see. That's good. I'm trying to Chevalier too many times. That's that's a good answer. Tesson. Thank okay. you. Okay. Terrific. Great to see you, and I will see you in a month in Hong Kong. Bye. <laughs>